Hello everyone, Juxtaposition here. Today's video will be entitled, George de Mornshield. I didn't want you to think I forgot about George de Mornshield. I'm just kidding, no one asks about him. Anyway, he's uh, a career CIA operative, crisis actor, and um, all-time soldier of clandestine services. He was born in uh, what is used to be referred to, I would, today it's, I believe it's called Belarus, Russia, his family had nobility status because they owned oil refineries, interest in the oil business in Russia. Anyway, they had a uh, setback. They lost their, uh, their holdings were nationalized and uh, George de Mornshield was sort of cut adrift and ended up in New York City. Not unlike many of the Jewish people from Romania, Poland, Lithuania did as well. And George de Mornschild is best known for four marriages, three divorces to wealthy uh, women where he got um, nice settlements. For knowing Jacqueline Kennedy when she was uh, an infant, knowing Jacqueline um, Bouvier's mother very well, perhaps he courted her. And... Uh, George DeMornshield is known as being a personal friend of George H.W. Bush. And um, George DeMornshield's son knew George W. Bush, who attended a private academy along with George DeMornshield's son. So they had that in common. And of course, they both worked for the CIA. George H.W. Bush, career CIA, was the CIA director for a whole year. And... Um, Anyway, we're going we're gonna to review a letter that George H.W. Bush had typed and signed to George de Mornschild not too far before George de Mornschild was murdered by the CIA. Had his head blown off by a 12, pardon me, a 20-gauge shotgun. A 20-gauge shotgun blew George de Mornschild's head off before he could get his $4,000 fee for his three days of interviews. Anyway, it was a murder. They always call, uh, you can tell it's a murder if the media calls it a suicide. Just know that's code for murder. All right, so George de Mornschild was born on April 17, 1911, again, where Belarus is. He fled, ended up in New York. He speaks fluent French. Um, that's probably how he communicated with the Bouvier family. And uh, he resided, he moved to, was positioned by the CIA to Dallas, Texas in 1952 um, to be part of the immigrant Russian community, which was probably fewer than 50 people in the town of Dallas in 1952. Very small group. You do know that Dallas is a port facility, so that would make sense. That, uh, that George de Mornschild would be assigned to a CIA port facility office. His address in Dallas, Texas was 2737 Kings Road, apartment 142, Dallas, Texas, zip code 75219. That is uh, less than one mile from Parkland Hospital, if you didn't know, where electroshock treatments are available. You should know that Parkland Hospital is completely CIA controlled and that that is why Jack Kennedy was taken there, and that is why Lee Oswald was taken there to make damn sure he didn't survive. In the case of John Kennedy, I think his head was blown off in plain view on Elm Street, so I don't think there was any question that he was dead. But just in case you want to have a CIA hospital, make sure that you are euthanized if necessary, which is what I believe may have happened to Lee Oswald because I'm not sure you would have died by one bullet shot to your stomach. Anyway, George de Mornschild was murdered at 1780, 1780 South Ocean Boulevard. It's about nine and a half miles south of the Breakers Hotel in West Palm Beach, Florida. Technically, the name of the enclave of 1780 South Ocean Boulevard is the community known as Manalal Pond. Florida. It's on a spit. 
Anyway, what I wanted to tell you is that's uh, 1A1, that's Highway 1. A1 is the Ocean Boulevard. <sighs> There's so much to discuss. I, I, uh, it's been a while since I researched um, George de Mornchild, but you should know that he was an ur urbane gentleman, spoke French, spoke English, spoke Russian. He... Um, He uh, was surrounded by CIA control agents. The House Assassination Committee, the House Subcommittee on Assassination wanted to um, have George de Mornchill testify in front of their hearing under oath in 1977. And I believe he was summoned to do so. He... Um, anticipated this would happen and he he wrote a letter to George Bush who was then CI director and George Bush wrote a typed written letter response where George H.W. Bush did what he always does which is nothing he never helps anybody except himself I'll post a copy of the letter it's applied linguistics 101 it's uh, I hear I feel your pain I'm not going to do a damn thing you're on your own um, after the letter was sent out to the um, King's Road address, George Bush, uh, the date of that letter was um, September 28, 1976. I believe George de Mornchill received something like nine electroshock treatments at Parkland Hospital during the next six months. And it was about six months later that on March 28th, Sometime around 2 p.m., he had his head blown off with a 20-gauge shotgun in the upstairs unit of a 9,000-square-foot beautiful home behind a hedgerow on an enclave with no sidewalks, again at um, 1780 South Ocean Boulevard. As far as people on the property at that time, there were quite a few people staying at the property. However, they all left. The owner of the property, Mrs. Nancy Tilton, she went off to play bridge card games at noon. So she was gone with her lady friends, giving her a perfect alibi. And then the, um, the cook, whose name is uh, Miss Romantic, <laughs> Lillian Romantic, <laughs> without a T, Lillian Romantic. R-O-M-A-N-I-C, Romantic. Lillian Romantic, she left to go to the postal office at around 1 o'clock, so she was gone. And then we had uh, Janine D. Marshall, wife number four. She was back in Texas at King's Road. You should know that Jack Cassidy was murdered in December 1976, right? After George Bush wrote his letter, his meaningless letter, to George de Mornchill, Jack Cassidy, the ex-husband of Shirley Jones, he was murdered at uh, 1221 North Kings Road in West Hollywood, one block from Sal Minio's murder a few months earlier. So isn't that interesting that Jack Cassidy was murdered in an apartment at uh, on Kings Road in West Hollywood? And that uh, George de Mornchild's legal address was at uh, Kings Road, Dallas, Texas, walking distance from the Parkland Hospital, where you can get electroshock treatments. There was a Mr. Coley Nimbly, who is the caretaker, care, caretaker landscape uh, supervisor for this mansion, which is, sits on about an acre of land. And he's a Negro, and he lives in a unit attached to the garage, so he doesn't stay in the main house. He has a unit attached to their magnificent four-car garage. So he was on the property, and the housekeeper allegedly was on the property. The housekeeper's name, I have it here somewhere, is... Um, Isn't that something? Anne 
Visola. Ann Visola is the housekeeper. She allegedly was uh, downstairs. George DeMornshield returned home from his interview. He did a three-hour interview at the Breakers Hotel with Edward Epstein. That's right, I said Epstein. He's a Jewish writer for Reader's Digest, and he has agreed to rent a Hertz rent-a-car for George DeMornshield, which George DeMornshield was driving on uh, the morning of um, March 29th, 1977. March 29, 1977, uh, George DeMornshield drove at around 8.30 in the morning from the Malapon Estate down to the Breakers. It's about a 10-mile drive, so it's going to take 12 minutes or so, or 15-minute drive. And um, he did three hours of interviews with uh, Edward Epstein. You know that room was bugged by the clandestine services. I'm sure they wanted to see what... Um, George DeMornshield was going to say in advance of his House Assassinations Committee hearing. I guess they didn't like it, so there was no need to re um, have an afternoon session, which was the plan at 3 p.m. They were going to re-conduct um, the interview for the afternoon session. There were going to be two additional days, so three days, three days, and approximately 20, over 20 hours of interviews with Edward uh, Epstein in exchange for $4,000 cash plus the rent-a-car. But uh, George DeMornshield returned back to the estate where his, sis his daughter Alexandra was. She resides in Mexico City, which is a clandestine service city if you didn't know, but she was visiting um, the Tiltons and she had a friend along by the name of um, Catherine Loomis. Don't know anything about Catherine Loomis, but she's got to be plugged into the network as, long, as, as well as Nancy Tilton, the owner of the property. And her husband was out in New Mexico. They have some grandiose cattle ranch out in New Mexico. So her, fa her husband wasn't home. She was out playing bridge with her girlfriends. Alexandra and Catherine Loomis went shopping at around 1.30, and this left George DeMornshield alone upstairs with the housekeeper downstairs and the caretaker in the garage unit. There is a swimming pool, of course, at this home, but that's it. So there are only three people in the home at two o'clock in the afternoon. Well, and only two of them are in the home. The housekeeper is downstairs on the ground level. George DeMornshield's on the second floor where he has his bedroom, and there's a long hallway there. And um, the caretaker is on a detached garage unit in an apartment. Anyway, uh, apparently a investigator from the House Assassinations Committee came by at between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. I'm going to say he's part of this murder operation. Gaten Fonzi, spelled G-A-E-T-O-N. He's probably there to do an inventory of who's home before the professional killers arrive. Anyway, Gaten Fonzi stops by under the pretext that he wanted to talk to uh, George DeMornshill about his house assassination, you know, testimony in advance, which of course is inappropriate. So the only reason he's nosing in there is he's doing some reconnaissance before the big boys arrive. Anyway, like I said, uh, George DeMornshill returned to the property by around 1.30. He visited with his daughter. They spoke in Spanish so that the others couldn't understand. And then the daughter and her friend Catherine Loomis left the property for about an hour and 10 minutes. They went shopping, probably on Worth Avenue. And when they return to their horror, they discover George DeMornshield's brains blown out all over the walls at the end of the hallway adjacent to his guest room. And uh, it's a 47-inch shotgun. You would need to remove your shoes and use your toe to pull the trigger. You can't reach the trigger and put it in your head. George DeMornshill was wearing shoes, so clearly he didn't pull the trigger. Someone else did. Of course, they ruled it a suicide. I will show you the police report. You can see how that got re-edited. Um, it's extremely detailed, except the part about how George DeMornshill... Um, had previously attempted suicide and was depressed. I don't think the local police could possibly know that. So I think that was injected into the report. 
All right. Um, I have there. There's a lot of details having to do with George de Mornchill. What I wanted to tell you is. I believe the clandestine services were nervous about him at age 65. He was under the supervision of a Yale alumni by the name of, uh, this guy's a real piece of work, um, because uh, he injects himself back into the story as soon as uh, George de Mornshield is dead. And uh, of course I'm talking about Wilhelm. Now let's see, I think I got him here somewhere. Yeah, I'm talking about none other than Wilhelm Ottoman, Ottman, O-T-T-M-A-N. He's a Dutch gentleman. He had invited uh, George de Mornschild over to Holland and Belgium to do a series of documentary style film interviews. Um, things didn't go well and George de Mornschild fled the interview and made his way back to New York. As soon as George de Mornschild was confirmed dead, William Ottman told anyone who would listen, and of course the CIA scheduled media for this, that he thought that he was the control agent of Lee Oswald and that he was well aware that Lee Oswald was going to kill John Kennedy and that he instructed him to do it himself personally because they really wanted to stay on the script of that Lee Oswald killed Jack Kennedy and uh, again part of the poppycock, right? And then later, uh, Wilhelm Ottman did testify at the House Subcommittee for Assassinations, where he repeated the poppycock story I just told you. And of course, they did absolutely nothing. There's nothing to corroborate the story, obviously. And it's, it's an untrue story, because I can assure you, as professional killers killed Jack Kennedy, nothing to do with George de Mornschild, and absolutely nothing to do with Lee Oswald. So... All I'm going to say about the George de Mornschild murder is it's consistent with all the other dozens of murders I've covered. The media is consistently incorrect. They're never right about anything. And they got COVID wrong, and they got Pearl Harbor wrong, and they got the USS Maine Spanish American War pretext wrong. They got 9 11 wrong. I mean, they've got the weather wrong. We have chemtrail attacks every day, it's not on the media. They don't cover it on television or newspaper or radio. So they've got the weather wrong. That's how pathetic it is living in this meta universe. All right, well, that's it for today. I just wanted you to know I didn't forget about George de Mornschel. There's a whole cast of characters that uh, I could do stories on. I just have to be motivated to do so. But I do want to emphasize that George de Mornschel was a uh, urbane gentleman who was fluent in French, English, and Russian. And he worked for the CIA until they terminated him at age 65. You should know that Jackie Kennedy got terminated at age 64. And he used to allegedly bounce Jackie Kennedy on his knee in front of her mother, Mrs. Bouvier, <laughs> which I think was her third husband. All right. Thanks for listening. Hit the like and subscribe. Please share my videos because I am shadow banned. Have a great day.